everyone. I am so thrilled that you're joining us here today because we're going to be talking about something that, well, we've already been told is a bit of a badass topic. <laughs> and I am joined, before we, we talk about what we're going to be talking about, I have to introduce my cohort, my so, soon-to-be partner in crime, I think, Lindsay Dowd, who is a badass speaker herself, founder, author, coach, podcast host, and just a general disruptor, which is why this is going to be the kind of conversation it's going to be. She was recognized as of the 2020 also named business coach of the year. I mean, not only is she the, an accomplished leader, a decorated seller, and has successfully managed both large, diverse, and high-performing sales teams over the last 25 years, 23 of those were spent climbing the ranks at IBM. Now, that in itself is a feat. She created her own company, Heartbeat for Hire, and she's devoted her career to transforming leadership through building irresistible culture, which is what I'm so excited to dive into today, and modern leadership practices to get best results from their teams. She's a thriving coach focused on sales, leadership, career, and culture. She's been featured in Fortune Magazine, HR.com, Authority Magazine, Business Management Daily, Valiant CEO, and I'm sure there's tons more of publications that you would recognize. Now, I didn't know this, but Lindsay, you also host the top 5% globally ranked podcast, Heartbeat for Hire, and you're also on tons of podcasts like today. So thank you so much for joining me to talk about why soft skills are so yesterday. Yes, I, I love this topic and I'm so happy to be sharing the floor with you today, Carol. Um, yeah, so if you are within earshot of this show, we are retiring the phrase soft skills and we are replacing it with power skills. Power skills are what we need to be focused on and soft skills really diminishes how important they are. And modern leaders have power skills in spades. So it's not such a different concept to what soft skills are, but we need to rebrand it because they are critical tenets to modern leadership. Yeah. And, you know, the thing that's interesting about this, when we were talking about this last week and you were describing this to me, and we were just kind of like going back and forth about it. One of the things that came to mind was when I remember doing an analysis of objective management group data and they had an analyzed a million sellers and showed that, you know, the thing about all of this is on our leadership teams is that the skill sets that top performers have, it's not about skill sets. It's about mindsets. Right. Oh, yeah. And the thing of this is, is that only 28% of sales professionals have the types of mindsets that are going to be successful. But here's the thing that is the kicker for leaders is that your mindsets and your beliefs towards certain things, your culture, this is the data showing that when you have certain non-supportive beliefs or mindsets and that impacts your culture at a rate of 355%. And while that's bad, the good news is that those leadership qualities that promoted supportive beliefs and mindsets, they had a rate of a thousand percent more likely that their team was going to have those. So those support, those supportive beliefs, those yeah. supportive mindsets have such a huge impact, but it's just so easy for us to slip back into those negative ones. Well, that that's, yeah, I'm so glad you brought up all of those statistics. And, you know, one fatal mistake that I see in sales over and over again. And this is where I came from. I spent 25 years in sales. So this isn't like first time go around. But the biggest mistake I see over and over again is leaders promote the top performers to management positions. Mm -hmm. And why that's dangerous is because the top performers in sales are typically motivated by their own wallet. And they don't generally care about others. Now, this is a generalization. There are certainly exceptions to the rule. However, when you're doing that and you're saying, OK, this person's crushed their number quarter after quarter, year over year, let's make them a manager. Are you asking the question, why do you want to be a leader? Because if the person is using that role to get ahead, to climb the ladder, that's not the best answer. If, they're, if they actually say, I really love seeing people win, or I believe I can take the skills that I have and teach them to other people and coach and remove obstacles. And when, when they win, I win, you're in the right lane. But so often when we promote these people that don't care about anybody but themselves, we are going to create a toxic workplace because that leader 
won't understand why their team can't do exactly what they did. They might have a challenging time communicating it, and the people are gonna get very frustrated. They won't feel seen, they will not build trust, there will be no psychological safety, and what ends up happening down the road is your top performers will leave and you are breeding a culture of mediocrity. Okay. So if you wanna keep breeding that mediocre culture, keep promoting the wrong people, because that's yes. exactly what will happen. And, then, and that's just one piece of it, right? Because I often say this phrase that companies a lot of times are creating the sales problems that they're trying to solve for. And culture has so much to do with that. And yeah. to your point, when top performers get promoted to managers, there's the mindsets that are there and that same statistics of how the leadership mindset is going to impact the team and they're creating these problems. And so you'll see sales managers taking over the deals for their salespeople because they have a belief that we need to get this over the line. They're so emotionally attached to the outcome. They forget that there's a learning lesson here for the salesperson, but they have to make their number. And so it's that me focused thing again. Yeah. I should have worn my T-shirt. I have the T-shirt, the not about me T-shirt to wear upside down. And it applies for managers and leadership as yeah. well. Like that's something in, a, in the culture that you just can't, you can't just put it on a board and say, this is our culture. This is something that happens in your everyday interactions with your team. Oh, and gosh. you don't even realize it. No, you're so spot on. And culture is a feeling. And this is why some... Some senior leaders are like, eh, it's fluffy, it's rainbows and sunshine, I don't have time for that, we've got pressure, we've got quotas, but here's the deal, micromanagement never inspired anyone, <laughs> and when you sit there and tell your people, like, I need to manage the deal for you, you're saying I don't trust you. Mm -hmm. When you give your team and your people the space to do the jobs they were hired for, and when you allow for failure, because we all fail. You always learn more from failure than you do from success. But when you allow those moments, oh my gosh, the magic will happen. And when you say, how do you want to run your territory? Or how do you want to lead this team? Because I had leaders do that for me. And I was like, me? You want to know? Oh my gosh, I would have done anything for those leaders. I was thinking differently. I was innovating. I was inspiring people around me because I had this opportunity to do things differently, to think differently, to challenge myself and challenge everyone around me. And mm -hmm. one more thing, leadership is not just for people with HR direct reports. Leadership can be from anybody. And I know when I was an individual contributor, I had to invite reps to want to work with me and want to work on my accounts. They had choices. They didn't have to work on my accounts, whether I was a client exec or a brand rep. I had to make my environment the most fun, the most lucrative, the most attractive for them. And when I did that, people loved working with me. And as a result, we crushed our number over and over again. But it yeah. was because someone believed in me and I believed in them. So right. it all does start at the top and trickle down, which I know we're going to talk about. I know, I know. Well, and it's not just that it starts at the top too, but then you think about it is also this a little bit of the telephone game is sometimes yeah. the translation from the top all the way through doesn't always match up. Mm -hmm. But I want to go back to one of the things that you said where, you know, a leader who says to their team member at any level, at any point, uh, how do you, what do you think? How do you want to yeah. run this? is so valuable. But here's yeah. the thing that I often find happens is that they'll give word to that. They'll say, tell me what you want to do or what you think. And then they do exactly what they wanted to do anyway. <laughs> and they ignored everything that they said. Yeah. They don't They don't close the feedback loop. And yeah. it makes that individual or feel like, okay, so uh, everything that you just said is complete BS because yeah. I told you what I thought and what I felt, but obviously you still don't care or because you didn't give me any feedback on that. You didn't say, you know, that's a great idea. Here's how we might incorporate that. Here's how, what some obstacles might be. You know, how, how, what do you think we might be able to work through that? Right. And, and it kicks me, it kills me every time because, you know, not only have you just demolished any trust that you just built with them, you've also that lost is. the opportunity to be innovative, to come up with new perspectives and yeah. ideas and have a diversity of thought within your organization, which by the way, all of these things, and I know that we're talking about the soft skills, it's so yesterday, like you say, it's the power skills, right. but it is also the revenue skills, people. I mean, oh, gosh. Oh, can I tell a story that illustrates what you're talking about? Yeah. So um, 
I was a client exec at a very, very large account with a $150 million quota. So like seriously huge account with tons of strings attached. We were each other's partners, we were each other's clients, and we were competitors. So everything that we did had a ripple effect in every direction. Um, so lots of pressure. And I had a new boss and I knew her for years and I was excited that she was my boss and I was presenting my strategy, what I wanted to do, my plan for how I was going to go after this client. And we're partway through and she just stops me and she says, girl, I've got your back. Now fly. And it took my breath away. And I was like, oh my gosh, if I screw up, she's got my back. So, okay. I can think differently now. So I had a team of 55 people. I had to basically say, you guys, we have an opportunity. We can try things we've never tried before. Who haven't we talked to? What haven't we done? And I basically said, show me what you want to do. Show me how you want to approach the client. And if I agree with it, you've got full entree. I will make any intro you need. Well, you know what happened? We closed a $23 million deal. That was the largest deal any of us had ever seen for this client. We all crushed our numbers. We made a crap ton of money and we changed the relationship with this client, both up and down. So at the senior levels, they liked what we were doing. And way down below, everybody's like, hey, I think I can help here. I think I can add value. And it just completely changed the dynamic of how we worked. And it stemmed from that one moment of I've got your back. Now fly. Yeah. So anybody that thinks that these little things are not heard, they are. They totally, totally are. And when you give people that kind of confidence, so much magic can happen. Yeah. So I'm going to add a little bit of stats to that. Okay. This is what you said absolutely plays out and it plays out at at every level, whether it's yeah. a multi-million dollar deal or, you know, a, a $2,000 monthly recurring subscription, yeah. whatever it might be. But what happens instead? is we often like, you know, right now we're in March, we're in the last month of the first quarter yeah. and everyone had these grandiose plans and ideas of what was going to happen in the first quarter to set them up for the rest of the year. Right. Maybe numbers are behind or they're flat or they're like, okay, if we, we don't get ahead of right. this in the next and the pressure is starting to build, right? Mm -hmm. The end of month, the end of quarter, it's only going to get worse throughout the year. And what happens is leadership starts to feel the pressure that pressure that gets transferred to the middle managers. Sure. Middle managers then roll that stuff downhill to their team. You gotta meet your numbers. Every meeting that we have is a pipeline review of this particular yeah. opportunity. Instead of what you just shared of being able to say, look, I've got your back, you've got this. Yeah. And what that does is it takes away the attachment to the outcome. It okay. takes away the emotional involvement that is then again, then going to cause your people, your salespeople, your customer success people, your account managers, when they get face to face with their buyers, they're under the pressure. And that's when you start seeing the pitches, the discounts, the, the yes. icky attempts to create. The desperation. Yep. And then, then you turning your buyers off and you as a leader have just created this scenario that you don't yep. even see happening. What you see happening is all of the numbers are starting to continue to go downhill. So you continue to apply more pressure, making yeah. the situation worse. Oh, I love that you said that and you're spot on. And the one thing that I think sales leaders always need to remind themselves of is you need to have one-on-one -on -one time with your teams beyond your forecast calls. Mm -hmm. And when you have that time, that time should be spent asking a few key questions. And these are questions that I come back to over and over again. There are questions I used when I was leading big teams and they made a massive difference. So one is, how can I be the best leader for you? When you ask that question, you are going to get wildly different answers from everyone you ask. And that's based on age, tenure, experience, goals, all of those things. Some people are going to say, I just need you to remove you know, obstacles, stay the hell out of my way. I'll call you when I need you. Some people are going to say, I need to role play. Can you help me? Because I don't really, I don't really think I'm doing this right. And that's only if there's trust, by the way. Mm -hmm. And then some other people might be like, I don't get my job. I don't get what I'm doing. I was transferred in from another team. Like, ah, what am I doing here? Because I've had all of these answers. But the other questions you need to ask are, what do you think you're really good at? And where do you want to improve? And when you know the answers to those questions, you can not only advocate for those people, you can delegate to them. And delegation is a power skill. When you give somebody something to do and you say, I got your back, this is on me. So if you mess up in some way, I'm taking the heat, but I want to give you an opportunity to shine. When I did this, Carol, 
my team would have done anything for me because I gave them the spotlight. I let them have a moment to, to feel success, to be exposed to senior leaders, to, to really, really show they had chops. And when I did this, I was perceived as a generous leader. It didn't matter that it wasn't my idea or my presentation. They were a direct reflection on me. But you're giving people the space to do the jobs they were hired for. And when you do that, all kinds of beautiful things happen. Yeah. You know, when we were talking about now, everyone who's listening in, believe it or not, I think this is only our second actual conversation, Lindsay. <laughs> so, like yeah. imagine what's going to happen months from now after any more conversations. It's going to be like a, a, a Yoda mind meld or something. <laughs> On. But one of the things that I find that's really interesting too is even though we have so much in common, you know, dogs in common, for example, yeah. we're both from Boston, you, the accents are, are going to start coming flying out any second now, people. But the other thing is, is you know, we have a similar approach, a similar perspective and view of things, but we come at it from different angles. Like I'm coming at it from, uh, you know, all of you leaders who, who I'm speaking to right now, I'm coming at this from the angle of I'm hearing what your salespeople in, are coming to me for with help because their managers aren't able to do this. And not all of it is manager's fault to lead, like, you know, it rolls uphill, so to speak. But you're coming at it from the perspective of the top down. But yes. like we're meeting in the middle and dancing a little dance here. Oh, God, and I love that you said that. <laughs> I know we have to go dancing. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that I often will share with managers and have individual salespeople do is a very simple exercise in personal goal setting. And it's just always so surprising to me every time I tell salespeople and sales leaders about this, how how they're like, it's such a simple thing to do, but it has such deep impact to what you were just saying too about asking those questions. And what I find is that when people go through this simple five-step process, the data actually shows that those that do this and do it consistently and reiterate it are 298% more likely to be top salespeople in their organization mm -hmm. because they also have 32% more skills. So it drives them to learn more. So this process actually bridges the gap between the knowing and the doing mm -hmm. and makes management easier. So first is like you were saying, you know, have that conversation with your people and ask them these questions, get them to start envisioning and daydreaming about something that's motivating outside of meeting their quota. Like yeah. you were saying before, like, you know, meeting your quota is about as motivating as getting up in the morning, excited to put your feet on the floor to pay your taxes, like no one ever. Um, but like, what do you want to design your life like? What's important to you? Why is that important to you? And really, when, you know, digging into like, you know, how they grew up and what was important in that. And then writing those things down is the second part of it, which is where most people stop. What do you mean write it down? It never happens the way we plan. Oh, and the, you know, and the bonus version, put it in your phone. Right. Oh, I love that. Call, and you have their partner's name, their children's name, their dog's name or cat's name. Yep. It's right there because there's nothing worse than telling them that you're really listening, asking these questions and you call their partner, Fred, and their partner's name is Sally. Like, yeah. don't embarrass yourself. Yeah. Really, yeah, make like, notes, people. Make <laughs> notes. Good make point. Notes. Yeah. And so, yes, write it down, but have your people also write down their goals. Okay. And then I, the third step is to share it with someone. Now, I don't say managers, you absolutely have to have your salespeople share their personal goals with you, but encourage it, you know, basically share it with anyone, but ask them to share it with someone who's going to be in their support network, because that person is going to become the person that they then report to, you know, also when that steps is creating, like you were saying, where do you think you have strengths? Where do you think you have weaknesses? Yep. But really assigning what you want to work on based on what goals you need to reach and the obstacles that are in your way and having it written down yeah. and shared and then using that and for salespeople, sharing that with your manager, that then becomes your learning path and action plan with your manager. So now you're being proactive with your manager and how you want this engagement to go. And for leaders, uh, shout out to Claire here. Claire, if you're listening, this is thank you for this idea. But when she went through this exercise with her team and it came time to do like recognition and rewards instead of the Oh, I'm going to give them like a hundred dollar, you know, restaurant gift card. Like mm -hmm. she learned like this person wants to build a, a, an addition on their house. I'm going to get them a Home Depot card. Yeah. You know, this person wants to travel. So I'm going to give them this type of a recognition. So oh, it's wow. so unique to each person to build that kind of collaborate. It's, it's really about building collaboration with your team because you want that to do that with their buyers. I, I, I love that you said that. And I, I really do believe whether you are a leader or a seller um, and especially for your clients, 
one of the things that one of the greatest lessons I ever learned, I had a leader once and she asked me, we were meeting for the first time and we had just done conference calls and we didn't even have Zoom then. So this, this is a while ago, but we finally met in person. And so we sat down and she says, so tell me your story. And I was like, what, what, really? And I'm like, how much do you want to know? And, but it was the start of me understanding she wanted to know me. She wanted to listen and she wanted to know what made, what made me tick. And I took that note. And if you listen to my show, that is the first question I ask every single one of my guests. Whenever I meet somebody, I always say, tell me your story because I'm going to better understand what motivates them, what yep. makes them who they are. And when you understand those things, you can advocate better. You can support them better. And you know things that you wouldn't necessarily hear if you just say, so what do you do? And when you're a sales rep and you're working with a client, ask that question. You will differentiate yourself. And if you know that they love sushi, send them a gift card to a sushi place or say, hey, I made us a reservation. We're going to go for sushi. And find the way to connect and relate. You are setting yourself apart from every other rep that calls them. Listen, write it down. It, it makes such an impact because you're no longer just that rep. You're the rep that remembered they loved spicy yeah. tuna rolls or whatever it was. Yeah. It, it really does come down to not making it about you. And it also really comes down to everything that you do as a leader is going to impact the person that they have to interact with. Okay. So all the way from the top, all the way down to the interaction that happens with the buyer is because of the culture that you've set here. Okay. And I know that we only have five minutes to go. So if anyone who, if you're listening and you have a question, we have a couple of minutes, please type that into wherever you're listening from, or if you're listening in later on, definitely reach out to Lindsay and I, ask the question, connect with us, say, hey, we saw you on sales TV, loved what you had to say about X, would love to learn more about Y. Mm -hmm. um, but closing thoughts, we have five minutes. Like, What was the like one thing that you'd love to leave people with, if anything else, Lindsay? So I definitely want everyone to stop using soft skills. And we are going to continue to refer to them oh, as power skills. skills. <laughs> the power skills will, will serve you for all of your days. When you lead with your heart, and I use the word lead loosely, whether you're an individual contributor or you're managing people, when you lead with heart, it will always serve you well. It will help you define your why. And when you understand your why and you understand your purpose, you will always be more successful. Whenever I could put passion into what I was doing, whatever I was selling, every time I could come up with the reason and the the how this is going to impact others, I always did better. I always yeah. did more. And whenever you can define that for yourself and put it out there, people will remember you and you want to be remembered. In this yeah. game, you have to be remembered. So this, this, after we had talked about this, Lindsay, I saw the post about Bob Moore, who's the founder of yes. Bob's Red Mill. Oh, he yeah. passed away at 94. And instead of selling his company, he, he actually gave it to his employees I over a period of time. I mean, I talk about the new golden rule in relation to buyers. And Bob really lived the golden rule. Uh -huh. You know, the new golden rule is those who have the gold make the rules. But the, Bob lived by the rule of he really lived it in his culture. So mm -hmm. when we talked about setting goals earlier and when I work with teams, that's like one of the exercises we go through because it aligns with purpose, like you said, to create that legacy. And that was what Bob was quoted as saying, and I want to leave everybody with this, which was my life's purpose, he said, was to build a company and maintain it so that it would create healthy foods for people around the world and offer financial security for my employees. Mm -hmm. Those are the kinds of companies that people are going to flock to and want to work with that I would want to work with that I would want my children to work with and would buy from every chance I get. I'm a huge fan of Red Mill products. So that makes me love them even more. So mm -hmm. everybody Soft skills are yesterday. These are power skills. These are revenue skills. Thank yes. you so much for joining me, Lindsay. This was so fun. We have to definitely do this again. Um, totally how, can people, how can people get in touch with you? What's the easiest way? Yeah, so I'm, my website is heartbeatforhire.com. Super easy, but I'm super active on LinkedIn. I'm also on Insta, TikTok, Facebook, um, YouTube. My podcast is on YouTube. So you can go to my website or you can find me anywhere at Lindsay Dowd, H4H. 
Awesome. And I'm Carol Mahoney. I am the founder of Unbound Growth, the author of Buyer First, Grow Your Business with Collaborative Selling. And likewise, I typically am on LinkedIn a couple of times a day. You can also find me on my website, carolmahoney.com. Don't forget the E at the end of Carol. And thank you all so much for having us and letting us take over the studio, Rob, and Sales TV. Make sure you follow us. Uh, reach out if you have any questions. Until next time, have fun. Uh, keep learning. Keep sharing out there. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Ilya.